Welcome to our broadcast from the beginning on Elizabeth Street in Little Italy. Martin Scorsese wanted to make movies. He started before high school by drawing his stories scene by scene. Ten years after making films at NYU, he had Mean Streets, Alice Doesn't Lear for You Anymore, and Taxi Driver on his list of directing credits. He had also introduced us to actors like Joe Pesci, Harvey Keitel, Jodie Foster, and Robert De Niro. In 1980, De Niro made Raging Bull, a movie many called the best of the decade. From the king of comedy to Goodfellas, Corsese continued to set the standard for American filmmaking. His latest is a much anticipated adaptation of the Edith Wharton novel, The Age of Innocent. It stars Daniel Day-Lewis, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Winona Ryder. And we're very pleased to have the director here with us for an hour of conversation about films and movie making and his own career. Welcome. It's Thank great you. to have you here. Thank you. I want to say one thing. I want to make sure to hear it out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Pronounce your last name for me. Uh, Scorsese. Sessi. All okay. right. And I said Sessi, and I wanted to make sure. <laughs> See, I wanted to, I've heard it different ways. I wanted to hear mm -hmm. it from you rather than from oh, six other people. That's why we decided to say it the family. We <laughs> <laughs> said so many different well, ways. Well, it's good for the family yeah, and good for me. Yeah, it's pretty much that. <laughs> Here is the question we begin with, though. This wonderful book written in 1920, won a Pulitzer mm -hmm. Prize, The Age of Innocence, about 1870s New York, the Gilded Age, all of that. And it is about unrequited love and sacrifice and family and society mm -hmm. and, it, and, and it repressed emotion and passion. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, Mean Streets, you know where I'm going, yeah. Mean Street, <laughs> <laughs> and Goodfellas, and Taxi Driver, yeah. and Raging Bull right. is about the expression of passion and right. emotion, the release of it all by dramatic characters. And some say, I can see how Mean Streets and all of those films, how it came natural to you and the characters you knew, but mm -hmm. this is so different. Yeah. Why did you want to do it, and why was it, as some say, a natural for you? Well, it's really interesting because my old friend Jay Cox, who used to uh, write movie reviews for Time Magazine, right. gave me the book back in 1980. We had known each other since 68. Um, and over the years, we saw so many different films. And over the years, we really um, tried to write work or uh, try to write scripts together and do all kinds of projects and really got involved with uh, wanting to do many different genres uh, westerns costume pieces you can call them costume, romantic films uh, uh, musicals etc and so around 1980 he gave me the book and said when you decide to do that romance piece he said uh, this one is you yeah. meaning um, uh, this has the qualities that you would like so why did he say that he knew before me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> apparently everybody else knows before me I'm yeah, the last one to right. know because the only way I can approach it I can tell you this when I finally did read the book because when he gave me the book I was finishing Raging Bull and I was yeah. going into King of Comedy and in a sense Raging Bull is a picture that is spinning I mean it has a, it's like a vortex of right. emotion I was very much into that state of mind mm -hmm. um, and so it took me a while to sit down and read the book but when I did I reacted immediately to the passion of the love story between Archer and Ellen, and especially the, un uh, the fact that it's unconsummated. Yeah. And especially, therefore, the tension, the dramatic conflict, the tension. Uh, naturally, maybe because I, when I read it, it was 1987, January, yeah. and I'd gotten older. Yes. You know? <laughs> or I maybe it older. said something to you in your life or it, something. It said something, but I reacted immediately to that. And I must tell you that I've read other books, and I, I, I love the books of Thomas Hardy and uh, other, other types of, other types of uh, classical literature and, and, um, and 19th century English literature. But this one, I said I can make into a film. Now, what those reasons were at the time, I couldn't articulate them. And it had to do with the emotion of it. It had to do with wanting something that we're not going to yeah. get. Yeah. And then had to do with the sense of responsibility, obligation, sacrifice. Yeah. But those you know, are themes that you have dealt with throughout yeah, your career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and closed societies you've not, dealt with. Right. Closed society consciously. Right. I mean, that was something that's where I grew up. And, right. and basically, I understood that from my father and my mother telling me stories or giving me examples. My father yeah. giving me examples of how to behave in certain situations uh, in closed societies and uh, very much come from a, a closed society. So that's the other thing about the book. The way she laid out the society. The way, the way she, uh, it was almost like Margaret Mead in Samoa, you know. <laughs> it, it, uh, this is amazing. I said, look at the, the dinnerware, the, yeah. the, the, the china. The uh, tribal. The tribal. She used the word tribal right. a number of times, right. and we use it in the film. And I am one of these people I happen to like anything on, uh, well, Channel 13, uh, that, that documentaries on tribes right. in, in, right. in uh, the Amazon, uh, Discovery Channel I have on all night. Yeah. Watch, it every, watch everything, wildlife adventures and stuff like that. And I'm fascinated by, by different cultures. I'm fascinated by the sense of refinement of a culture where, um, well, where you know, in the and jungle they, they eat off a leaf and, and over how here they, they eat off the crown derby. Rule. Each one has its yes. own rules, its yeah. own conduct, its yeah. own sense of 
what's right. proper and what's right. not and what's allowed and what's not. Right, and, and, and of course the consequences yeah. of not doing that. And then you take this idea, you take this incredible passion the two of them feel for each other, and they can't consummate it, and you put it in the middle of a chessboard in a way. Yeah. And there's the rules of the game. Yeah. And they cannot, they cannot do what they, what they want to do. Can and, you uh, imagine, though, tension. As, as some, uh, you may have said this, you know, the notion of just the touch of a hand yeah. can bring as yeah. much satisfaction yes. in another yeah. environment, the most explosive lovemaking. Absolutely, yeah, and that, that's, that was the key. I mean, that for me, automatically, automatically I see where to place the camera when I, when I feel that emotion. That's what I had said, that if they brush their hands together by accident, it's almost as if they had consummated the relationship, and I know then how to shoot it. The intensity of it. Well, tell me about that. Well, it's a, it's a matter of 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 expressing a feeling of um, uh, sometimes a, a physical feeling, a chill yeah. or a, or a sensation of pleasure or a sensation of a, a surge through your body. A surge through your body and how it's interpreted through an image. Yeah. You know, um, it's where to place that lens. How because when you when you when you're making a picture as a director, you're taking a lens and you're showing the audience what to look at. Start with you, tilt down to here, pan over here. Right. Something comes. In, uh, the story. And you're leading that thought process. You're leading process that thought process. That. So that that is directing. And when I when I feel that kind of emotion, it makes it easier for me to aim that lens. And that's fun. Yeah, because you know where the payoff is. Yeah, the payoff yeah. is. And yeah. what's the final shot then? The, I mean, the payoff is the touching in in a, in a close up. I think I think ultimately. Or to the face. Yeah, the faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the faces. The and, and the faces turning away. Stay in the back of the head. Now, <laughs> let me just talk about this. It's about a lot of lot of things here about you want it. You caught up in the story. Yeah. You also caught up in the context of where this story can be placed. Yeah. Yeah. Was any any other driving motivations for you? Oh, yes. Because it, what were they? Well, um, it, you know, naturally, um, having had asthma when I was three years old, yeah. I saw so many films right. because they uh, didn't allow me to play yeah. um, sports, and so I to this day know nothing really about sports, and I just uh, you know. Basically, I have no, no idea. But my father and my mother took me to many films, and I became aware of um, many different kinds of films. Um, when I started to make them, as I said with Jay, we talked about doing a western. We talked about doing different things. And the '70s was revising the genre, but now I'm not so sure. Now yeah. there's so much revisionist work in the western that maybe it's better to do the mythological western again. I don't know. But in any event, um, uh, here, when I became a film student was the early 60s and at that time you had the French New Wave, the Italian New Wave, British New Wave and you had uh, the New American Cinema in New York, Jonas Mikas, Shirley Clark, John Cassavetes who was mm -hmm. the clearest, uh, the most independent of them all in that way. Um, uh, the underground cinema, Stan Brackage, so many different things going on with cinema and it all collided together and one of the, one of the most remarkable filmmakers to come out, well actually come out during the uh, 40s but in, and into the 50s and sort of flower in the 60s was Visconti, Lucino right. Visconti. And Rocco and his brothers was a picture that, that had a great influence on me. Of course we saw when it came out in America in the early 60s it was a cut version, mm -hmm. but it didn't matter, it was very powerful. Uh, and then The Leopard, which at first puzzled me uh, because of its length. I didn't understand, I didn't know the, uh, I didn't understand the, the social history of Italy and, and Sicily. I didn't understand what was happening, but, but after years of watching the film repeatedly, um, I became uh, wrapped up in his, his approach to uh, detail. Mm -hmm. And I remember what, what Burt Lancaster said when they asked him, how could you play a count? And he said, well, I, I, he said, I, very simple, I just looked at Visconti. Because he <laughs> was the Visconti's yeah. of Milan. Yes. I just watched yes. how, he, how, yeah. how, he, how he moved. Yeah. And as I, as I said to a lot of other people, at uh, an age of innocence, they certainly shouldn't have looked at me. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> not a world you knew. It was really not a world I knew, offhanded, yeah. yeah. But when you, you know, when you have people like Daniel Day-Lewis and yeah. uh, Michelle who did all that work and Winona, and yeah. uh, then you have, you're surrounded with Alec McCowan and Miriam Margolis. And yeah. But you Sean did a Phelps lot more, though. I mean, what the, the attention, which is a hallmark of your work, the attention to detail here is extraordinary. You looked, you, had a, you did an investigation into the book and found out who the character oh, yeah. was characters were modeled after right, exactly. and then went to where their homes were <laughs> yeah, and right. their apartments and what paintings were in their apartments yeah, yeah, and yeah, how do you yeah. duplicate those paintings and you had yeah. 500 yeah, yes, recreations yes. of paintings so you could right. create authenticity. Right, but right. Why was that necessary? Well, it, it's, um, uh, it, makes it, it makes you feel comfortable. As you're making the film, it makes you feel comfortable. Get, you get to know the people. Most importantly, the pictures that were hanging in their houses yeah. told you about the people. It's character. It's all character, and then once you have that kind of painting in the house, and 
and Sean Phillips is, is sitting there and she's Mrs. Archer and there's a painting of a cow on the wall. Uh, you know, it's not a painting of the Bouguereau. It's not a Bouguereau yeah. painting. It's a big difference. Yeah. And she behaves a certain way and, and it's, it, it makes it, uh, it gives it a sense of a, a, a cushion in a way, um, um, a sense of truth that we were looking for. Um, my researcher, uh, I, I've said this a number of times, my researcher worked on this two and a half years in advance. To make sure you had yeah. the detail yeah. right. Also, that helps the budget. <laughs> it took the budget way up, didn't well, it? Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, the budget on this picture was less than Cape Fear. Yeah, the budget is said to be around 40 million. Well, initially, uh, basically, the actual 40 million maybe with Prince advertising right, and that right, sort of okay. thing, but, but it was 32. Because you had been out and done your homework yes, early yeah, on. Exactly. So when exactly. you came to the yeah, action, yeah. you were prepared. We knew what we were. I, I, at one point, you know, I had it all in the script with Jay Cox. We wrote it in. Uh, dolly into the centerpiece of the Van der Leiden's table. Now, what the centerpiece looked like, yeah. I wasn't sure. So then a year later, um, my researcher uh, one, had one meeting with me just on centerpieces. Yeah. Uh, and we chose certain ones uh, yeah. above others. And uh, uh, plates, how the oysters looked on a plate. Yeah. What kind of plate the oysters should be And what be kind on. of gloves did they wear? Oh, very and important. all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, the, the shot of the gloves, um, uh, that's very important. I mean, it, very, very often you, we don't explain w what it is, but it's enough to know the, um, the um, fussiness of the ritual. Everything was yeah. a ritual. You love ritual. Yeah. yeah Why? I, I, um, that's a good question. I, I, uh, I think it comes from uh, a background in the Catholic Church. I think uh, yeah. as, as a child I felt a good sense uh, a sense of um, real um, warmth and uh, security at the mass, watching the mass, and it's protected. Yeah, yeah, and things were done in a certain way, and, it, and, and they are done in this manner, from one to ten, in order to be proper for, yeah. you know, uh, for this uh, for this mass to work. Uh, and in the case, it's followed through. I mean, there are certain things in my family, even though. Um, uh, it's a working class family. There, there were certain things on the holidays. There were certain rituals that were that were attended to. Certain rituals in the dinner, yeah. and that sort of thing. And it made it. Um, it gave it a sense of order, a sense of order and a sense of um, propriety. Yeah. That was interesting. Speaking of the budget, I want to make just a couple of things before we talk about casting. It is said that that uh, Daniel Day Lewis and Michelle Piper gave up some in order for you to. Th did they I, forego some of that? I think so. I don't know. That? I don't know. I have to ask my, my producer on that. I'd forgotten. Yeah. I think they did. But that's a credit I mean, to them if yes, they did absolutely. in yeah. order for you to be able to make this yeah. kind of film. Because you have to understand, I think today the average American film costs about $27 million. Mm -hmm. So for Age of Innocence to go in at a budget of 32 costume, costumes, costumes uh, uh, yeah. horse and carriages, and that's it. Not too bad. Yeah. You know. Why did you cast Daniel Day-Lewis? Was he the obvious and only choice in your head? I, yeah, you know, it was. It was the only choice. I saw him in My Left Foot. Now, you can't say, well, My Left Foot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a big, there's a big difference. But right. what I saw in My Left Foot was the um, dedication, because I saw how difficult it was for him to do that. Yeah. And so much so that after about 10 minutes of the picture, I had, I had forgotten it was an actor. I thought it was... Um, uh, or uh, I, it, suddenly suspension of, you know, I just believed everything yeah. was happening. But then at the same time I saw him an unbearable lightness of being. Yeah. And I liked the sense of romance that he had. Right. And the way he moved into the frame. He yeah. floated, yeah. you know. And he had a sense of, of um, a stature yeah. to him. And um, I got to meet him the day before he won his Academy Award for My Left Foot right. in Los Angeles. And I said, I want you to do this. And you know, he and said uh, immediately, yes? I, no, not necessarily. But he, he talked and we talked a little bit. but. Yeah. Uh, uh, by the end of it, I believe he, 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 was, yeah. he, was, he was convinced he wanted to do it, but uh, um, then I met him again in England, um, and Stephen Freer's worked on him, yeah. Harvey Weinstein worked on him right. from Miramax. <laughs> from Miramax, right. Yeah, Miramax. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> they all worked on him, do the picture, you know. So um, it turned out okay. Michelle Pfeiffer. Now, Michelle, it's interesting because Michelle, um, oddly enough, I've said this before too in other places, but I saw uh, Jonathan Demme showed me uh, Married to the Mob. Right. And I'm usually very particular about um, right. non-Italian Americans playing Italian Americans right. in films, especially if the film is, is a sen uh, has a sense of, uh, of authenticity, supposed to be authenticity about it. However, this was a farce. It's different. Yeah. Yeah, Dean Stockwell doing a having a lot of fun right. with it. Um, uh, all, 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 the, all the people were having it. It was a really enjoyable film. And I must say, um, I did not know it was Michelle. I just didn't know. I'd forgotten. I I'd, I'd looked at the credits, but I didn't really completely forgotten. And then th about a few a few months later, I saw a Dangerous Liaison. Yeah. And I saw which everybody would imagine would be the reason you chose her. No, no. I saw, I saw the range. Mom. I saw the right, range. Right. I saw she had she had a, an authority within the, within yeah. a, a wide range. 
And then Brian De Palma told me, Marty, she was in Scarface. I said, oh my, I didn't realize. Yeah. <laughs> Goes way back. And um, what it is is that uh, she seems to change with every part. Yeah. And she's really, uh, the quality of her face is uh, someone described as luminous in this particular film, especially Age of Innocence. And she had that on the set. She yeah. had that. She'd come on the set and you, she was Ellen. And was so that? was Daniel, by the yeah. way. He was Archer. No question. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we had. <laughs> and the magic was there because the hardest thing, I would think, just not knowing anything about films, the hardest thing I'd think would be for the director is you have to convince me in the audience mm. that these two people were so passionate for each other. Because right. you got to understand right. what right. drives them to each other right. in order to understand the sacrifice right. that he's making for some other thing that's part of who he is. Right, and very difficult, especially if the yeah. people are not allowed to express themselves. Yeah, exactly. And that was the hardest part of uh, Li unlike making, unbearable. Yeah, yeah. Un unlike unbearable likeness right. of being, where at least they can express themselves. Right. Uh, here, here, it's a look, it's a glance away. It's uh, yeah. uh, she touches her opera glasses, yeah, or the thumb, right. you know, right. close-ups of that, uh, yeah. close-ups of the, uh, the fire, or the, yeah. those fire when it, when it sort of pops, right. and that's right. close-ups of that, you know, and those 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 long discussions that they had where. Uh, they remember every word of it, yeah. you know, and then they remember when the fire or made that noise, you know, the popping noise, and uh, and so uh, uh, so gingerly they had to be careful about how they spoke to each other. That's why one of my favorite scenes, I think, is the uh, a scene in the opera, in the uh, not in the opera, but in the um, in the uh, theater, when he goes up to the, the the box and she talks about May being an Augustine, right. and do you think her lover, do you think her lover would send her yellow roses, and what we did there in order to make that excruciatingly painful for every, uh, ha each other, hanging on each other's words, right. every word, was we dropped all the sound out completely, mm -hmm. completely, and we irised in on the two of them, an old-fashioned silent movie, right. irised in, right. and just separated them from everybody, sound and picture, and they hang on every word, <laughs> and of course they, you yeah. know, they miss each other again. <laughs> yeah, all right. I don't know, we've got a tape, we've got at least a scene here, this is from The Age of Innocence, Daniel Day-Lewis and Michelle Pfeiffer, take a look. Let me make a couple of points here, is that the notion for all that there is in this conflict, you're saying that all those people who make a point about so, many, so much violence that there is here, the violence here is emotional and psychological. Yeah, it's refinement, and it's refined violence. It's emotional and psychological violence, just as powerful and just as deadly as, uh, as Joe Pesci getting shot in, in Goodfellas. I really believe that. I, I remember it, and I've said this a number of times too, when my father took me to see The Heiress, yeah. uh, back around 1950 or 51, I was about nine years old. And he must have taken me because it must have been a Western in the bottom half of the double bill. I liked Westerns. And um, uh, in The Heiress, I remember watching the film. I didn't really understand all of it. It was nine. But one thing I did see, and that was Olivia de Havilland and her father, the relationship between the two. And this uh, wonderful scene where Ralph Richardson explains yeah. to her in the drawing room that uh, Montgomery Clift can't be after her to marry her for uh, her ability, her beauty, first of all, because you're very plain, he explains, yeah. and also you're not very witty, you know, because he, he yeah. resents her for having lost his wife when she was born, and he really hates her. Um, he says, so therefore he must be marrying you for your money. He wants to marry you for your money, I'm not going to allow it. And I remember, despite the fact that he was so polite, Ralph Richardson, yeah. and she was so proper, and the room had such wonderful things in it, uh, and they had such wonderful clothes on, I remember how, how Shocking that was yeah. to me for a father to tell his, his child. And then, of course, the powerful ending um, where she finally um, comes up towards the stairs with that lamp uh, glowing on her face and Montgomery Clift is locked outside banging on the door. And yeah. I, I had a sense of such, uh, such violence emotionally that had occurred to these people, and yet their behavior was so proper. Yeah. And I never gotten over that tension of seeing that, yeah. seeing that in the film. How did this movie, in the making of this movie, and the involvement in this, did it have any impact on you and the way you live your life in some sense of... Well, actually it did. I mean, um, uh, it also could be because I'm a little older, but, yeah. <laughs> but um, um, I really began to appreciate, um, of course now, when I say this, we're dealing with a society in this particular film right. that's got a lot of money right. to live a certain way, but I began to appreciate a slower way of living. Uh, really, uh, that there was some merit there in yes. some aspects oh, yeah. of their yeah. life. Yeah, images weren't necessarily, images didn't necessarily attack you the way they mm -hmm. do on a, on a video screen now. Um, some of it is very good, some of the imagery on video, um, on television. But uh, between the commercials and a lot of the, the music spots um, yeah. and um, 
promos, uh, the images are so, uh, they're violent. And I don't mean the images themselves, but no, the, no, I know what you mean. The, the, the speed, pace, the and speed cut. and the pace and the cut is so frightening, um, and it's desensitizing everyone. And mm -hmm. uh, I always wondered, do we really need? I, I like it when I when I'm able to get and the Concorde works. It's great. You get in it when it works. Sometimes you have to go back. Yeah, right. But <laughs> but uh, um, when it works, you get into England in three hours and ten minutes. We get to uh, France in three hours twenty minutes. But it really is that necessary? Yeah. Is it really that necessary? You don't like MTV. Uh, I don't. Can't say. It doesn't speak to me anymore. When it first came on, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I enjoyed it. But I began to question the validity of groups that um, became famous as musical groups because of the video. Right, right. And then where's the music? Yeah. And where are the lyrics? Yeah. And what are they saying? Never but, mind. But what didn't are they saying? you once make bad? Did oh, yeah. you make the video yeah, for I made bad? bad for I made bad Michael? and uh, Michael Jackson. And what I was interested there was, uh, you know, dancing. Yeah. Of course, camera movement is choreography, it's dancing. Yeah. I mean, a raging bull. Uh, the fight scenes were envisioned and drawn on paper by me um, as if they were bars of music. In other words, uh, five, let's say, five or six punches became uh, two bars of music. And I covered that f those five or six punches in one shot. In other words, we didn't shoot seven cameras and cut it, do it later in the editing. Right. It was shot one, which covered the first five, uh, six punches, to shot two, which covers the reaction to one of those punches, mm -hmm. track around this way, and you cut the two shots together and you have the flow. Yeah. And it was like dancing, you right. see. And that's why I figured... Um, we can really, I mean, Michael Jackson's, uh, Jackson's incredible. Let's, have, let's do it, you know, especially in the subway, you know, uh, yeah. sort of like West Side Story, um, right, the right. design, Robert Wise film with uh, Boris Levin when he did the, yeah. uh, that incredible the, the scene of them dancing in the, in the subway. Um, and uh, I really like musical. I like, I like musicals. I like dancing. And I did one for my friend Robbie Robertson, too, called Somewhere Down the Crazy River. Yeah. But that was just a D Did one Fred Astaire, shoot. when they shot those dance, great movies, oh, yeah. and you know, were shot... A wide shots and and just like you just said, I think, yes. as I remember, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. He had it in his contract that uh, he had to be seen head to toe. Yeah. So it know. would not be, uh, it would not be a cinematic technique that made him so good. It would in fact be what he, he was doing. To. Yeah. But however, in in, in bad, yeah, uh, we do cuts and we move in tighter and emphasize certain ter certain moves with camera movement. I'm interested in the camera movement being as much of a dancer as he is, if possible. You yeah. Know? Uh, you know, in the red shoes, for example, you have uh, another way of looking at dancing right. altogether, which is extraordinary. But I think the purist, a real dancer, a real ballet dancer, uh, uh, may may not like the idea. But what Paul Pressburger did in the sequence of the Red Shoes ballet yeah. was uh, by cutting and by camera movement and by use of color and um, slowing up the speed of the film and and and, and speeding it up. Uh, they were able to um, create not necessarily the actual physical movements of the uh, dancers. You don't really see that that clearly. What you get is the spirit of the dance. Mm. You get the spirit, the exhilaration of it, the soul of the dance, and. Uh, and that's why I always, I always keep going back to that sequence. It's amazing. It's really a uh, filmmaking that he also took from the silent films, because mm -hmm. Michael Powell used to work in silent films. Right. And uh, he, it's just an extraordinary and, and piece. His, and, you know, and his wife now. Yes, Thelma. Is your editor. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 Talk to me about editing, because you believe what? Editing is the magic of yeah. filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I think Stanley Kubrick said that the only original yeah. contribution to film uh, Different from all the other arts because it comprises all the, it, it combines all the other arts really, but the only thing that's originally film is editing, is yeah. the editing process. The unique thing the about unique, film unique, as an art form uh, exactly. is the editing. Yeah, is really yeah. editing because you can stretch it. Stretch uh, they, they they call it plasticity. Right, film it is like plastic. Right. Yeah, you can stretch it. You can you can stre stretch out time. You can you can. Uh, uh, it's I always get amazed when I'm in the cutting room. Um, I work very closely with Thelma and. Um, you know, when you still, I still get a thrill when you cut one shot next to the, next to the other, and yeah. there's a movement, but not a movement of, I must say, it's not a movement necessarily of the movement that's on shot A going to shot B, and the movement of shot B coming from shot A. It's what the movement that is conjured up in your head by the cut. Yeah. It's like a spiritual move in a way. Um, and I, I've studied older films and try to figure out how I got that impression when I saw that particular film, The Third Man, or something like that. Uh, let me see, it was on that cut, wasn't it? And I look and I see that there isn't any movement between the two shots. I imagine yeah. movement. How you know? many movies do you have in your head? Oh, I have a lot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they took me. There. there was nothing else they could do with me. They took me to the yeah. movies. I loved animals. I couldn't go near animals. Yeah. So I could because get of the, yeah, the yeah, asthma. Right. Yeah, naturally, it was, it was really, uh, I couldn't breathe. I remember in the late 40s, it was really, it was really tough. And we, uh, I would look at these uh, westerns with uh, Palominos, right. you know, and this old true color, the Republic true color, where the, yeah. where the sky was blue-green. You know, yeah, <laughs> it was right. so magical, and the, right. and the cowboys wore like fringe on their, j their jackets. It was great. You know, how? What kind of debt do you owe to your father? Well, for sort of. Yeah, it. 
the, this particular film, Age of Innocence, is dedicated to him, but um, in the sense that um, it's 20 years since I made Mean Streets. Right. Uh, even though I had made a feature right before that, Boxcar Bertha, Mean Streets is really, in a sense, a, uh, um, the, the film which has sort of formed me in a way. Um, it's so radically different, on the surface at least, from Mean Streets, 20 years. Um, and uh, the exposure to all these different types of films, and I think the way we communicated was through films. In other words, he took me to see him. Very often he wouldn't talk. Yeah. He would just go and see these movies. You wouldn't talk about him after? No. 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 He would just take you would as take an me. obligation yeah. of a father yeah. to a son who was yeah. asthmatic. And but he loved movies too. Apparently yeah. in the 30s he would see a lot of yeah. pictures and uh, he really liked films a lot. Every now and then I caught him talking about a few. He liked Day the Earth Stood Still, yeah. a bunch of others. But uh, uh, he, I don't know if he really preferred musicals. He would be com he'd complain when I had to, when I, when I <laughs> tell him, take me to see uh, you know, Gene Kelly yeah. and uh, so right. and so. But, but he would like them when I, when I got him there. But he uh, also took me to see I guess because of these westerns, I got to see The Heiress, I got to see The Bad and yeah, the Beautiful, right. I got to see Sunset Boulevard, you yeah. know, pictures that were normally <laughs> for, right, <laughs> for right. adults, it was right. great. You know? yeah. Now, you, you always put him in the film, you would put him and my mother, yes. and your mother in oh, the yeah. film. Yeah. Yeah. Did they want to be in? Well, no, no, uh, not, or, not originally. In fact, you've got to understand, I mean, from where I came from, uh, for me to go to New York University, first of all, was a right. big thing because there was hardly anyone in my family went to, uh, uh, it was a working class, didn't, right. there were no books in the house, they didn't read. Um, and NYU was, a, in the early 60s, was a different kind of thing. Uh, and uh, from other, uh, other people in the, the family maybe went to high school and that was it or, or went to certain trade schools. But I went to NYU studying arts and then film. And for somebody like me to be able to make films and get to this, this stage, it's almost uh, totally surreal. My father, the year before he died, when I, I think we were in Italy, and he was sitting there saying to my mother, he said, if anybody had told me yeah. that we'd be here now with, uh, I think we were visiting Armani in Milan, it was two yeah, years ago, right, right. We're doing, I was doing a documentary, right. and we'd be going to Sicily to see my people uh, in Sicily, and, and uh, we'd have a life that we had now, I would have never believed it. Because it comes from, it's like coming from Mars. I mean, yeah. really, it's, it's, it's so, so in a way, in the short films that I made at NYU, um, I had to draft them into it, mm. I needed them. And since they were willing to pay the, the tuition, uh, they figured, well, I better go and sit in. I'll be an extra. And my mother, yeah. you know, I, I, I forced her to come in. And, and uh, you got to, mom, you got to get up five o'clock in the morning, make some uh, spaghetti for the scene. We have right, to, right, and right, just right. keep it there. It's going to get cold. It doesn't matter if it's cold. It's a film. Don't worry about it. They'll eat it. <laughs> and it goes on uh, that sort of thing. And finally, finally, uh, Mean Streets. When we did Mean Streets, it, it uh, sort of brought it all back home. And that's when they realized something was, uh, something was kind of special for them. And uh, and since then, I was able to, uh, lucky to sort of have them around a lot. And, and I kind of. When, when I'm making a film, I have them there on the set. It kind of, uh, kind of, it's like my roots. It kind it of reminded you. Of yeah. Your roots. So you don't get, yeah. you know, you don't say. You remind, it reminds you, and it yeah. kind of diffuses situations yeah. too. Where I'll be going into the, shooting a very difficult scene, and she'll be knitting out there. My mother, and as I go past the trailer, she goes, "Hi, how's everything going? <laughs> fine, mom, fine." <laughs> <laughs> and she got, she she got a little bit angry at you, or was it anger? May not be the right emotion when she found out that that the scene she set with you in Goodfellas, when you came by, and you and yeah. and, and the body and the. Oh yeah, yeah she the, didn't. Yeah, she didn't. Wasn't happy about that when she no. found out, or she what? Well, she. Uh, we would never tell her there was a body in the trunk. No, no, no. no. She. You see, uh, they're like natural actors. I mean, in the sense, I learned this from Cassavetes or from a lot of these people, where anybody really is. Everybody's an actor. Is capable of being an it's actor and, really, and doing yeah. an authentic scene. Yeah, as if long they're as born to something they know. Something they know. In the reality, something she knows. She hasn't seen her son. He lives in the house, right? Yeah. He comes home around two in the morning with some of his friends. Right. She's delighted to see him and cook for them. And cook for them. Right. But you know, not if. If she knew there was a body in the yeah. trunk, the whole scene would be ruined. Right, right. So we were laughing. <laughs> Bob, uh, Joe Pesci were giggling all the time. Yeah. And, um, but she didn't know. She, just, she was happy to see her son. And she knows Joe for 10 years. She knows De Niro for like 25 years. Yeah. And Ray, she, she got to know. So it was, it was very simple. And we, we only had a couple of written lines, but the rest was improvised. Yeah. You know? Let me take a look at this is a scene which you haven't, probably haven't seen for a while from American Masters, the hour they did mm -hmm. with you. Uh, and this is Marty's parents. Here it is. He came along with this uh, picture and he says, I want you to tell me the stories you told me when, we, when I was a kid. I said, how am I going to remember? He said, I'll refresh your memory. He, did. he, had no, a, he says to me. He had a, a, a brain as a kid. He was two years old. My He's, wife took him for, we took him for tonsils in, in Flushing Hospital. Don't tell him that. Yeah. <laughs> so my wife says to him, you are going to go to the circus. I says to him, the nurse, is, oh, I said, the nurse is going to come, and she's going to take you. She's going to take you to the circus. So he was thrilled. <laughs> he went to the, he, he, she took him, she carried, she took him away. And of course, he didn't see me anymore. So the next morning, I'm supposed to pick him up. So I went back. We rushed back the next morning, 
And there he was in the waiting room, sitting on a little bench, and he was bitter. I said to Charlie, what's wrong with him? He's so mad. So we, we picked him up and we brought him home. And he didn't say anything. Do you know that a couple of years later... No, a couple of years. About, uh, about seven years ago. About seven years, seven ago, years ago. He says to me, Mother, you did something I to me. I got something to tell you. I have something to say to you that I can't, I can't hold it back any longer. I said, what is it? He says, you should have never did that to me when you took me for tonsils. I said, what did I do? He says, you lied to me. You yeah. said to me that the nurse was bringing me to the circus, and you lied. You I said, should well, never I had to bring that. you something. <laughs> he says, don't ever do that. You should always tell the children or what you're doing the truth. He says, because I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> now, you just... Uh, <laughs> he saw. Your, your dad yes. died August 23rd. Yeah, about, yeah. You know? And uh, I think in uh, May, June, or June, I think, he saw the film in a rough cut. Yeah. And uh, really appreciated it, loved it, and said the whole thing is the last, last half hour. He's right, because yeah. it, if you, the whole thing is paced so that it all comes together in the last 20 minutes of the film. Yeah. And, you know, he said he really, really thinks he thought it was going to affect emotionally a lot of people, and it turned out to be right. Yeah. I, uh, we had just anticipated uh, doing a decent gross in the first opening for that right, type of right, film, right. but apparently people are going back three or four times, and it has to be the emotion of it. It has to be going through a certain emotion yeah. that I had when I read the book and I had when I was making yeah. the film. I know. mean, it would seem to me that you could say, those people say, well, this is not the kind of film he does. You could say, this is about a love story. Everybody can yeah. make a love That's story if it. they're a talented yeah. Yeah. filmmaker. Yeah. Because it's common to all of us to That's understand right. love and passion. The emotions, the the emotions are human emotions. I yeah. mean, should you be able to do it, you know? Yeah. But, um, no, I hadn't seen that uh, clip. I was, I was always <laughs> holding my ears. So yeah. <laughs> because? It's, um, um, most of the films I make, I can't look at. Uh, they're too personal and... Uh, um, one I, one I could look at because of the humor of it is Goodfellas. Yeah. But let me go back. How about Mean Streets? Mean Streets I can't look at. It's too personal, too close. It's, it's, it's what you knew. Yeah, it's part, partially me, partially some yeah. old close friends of mine who is luckily some of them are still around. And, yeah. um, it is kind of a uh, heightened sense of the, of the life we were leading at the time, when I, just about when I was about to go to university. Um, and so, because um, you, you know, when I lived on Elizabeth Street yeah. between... Um, between uh, Houston and Prince, you know, if you go down Houston Street about eight blocks, is the West Side. Yeah. But we never did that. Why not? Well, we didn't have to. We had everything there in the yeah. neighborhood. Why you, go you there? You didn't go beyond your neighborhood. No, your, no, not at all. We, we had our own, our own sense of uh, morality and uh, codes, and uh, which were based on codes of behavior. And I began to realize this in the late '80s, early yeah. '90s, when we went to Sicily right. to visit um, Cimina, the hometown of my mother's uh, people, and Polizzi Generosa, the hometown of my father's people. And we began to see the structure, what it was like. It was really more or less the structure of a Sicilian village, mm. you know, on Elizabeth Street. And on Mott Street, uh, another village. Uh, uh, it gets, it's very interesting. 232 Elizabeth Street would be mainly people from Cimina. Across the way at 241 was mainly people from Polizzi. So the buildings took on the, yeah. the, 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 the and all, crum, all crammed together. And uh, you had uh, uh, very much a very provincial point of view. I, was, I might as well have been yeah. coming out of a village in Sicily in 1960. And so somebody like me walks along and says, how does that shape your filmmaking? Well, it shapes it because I, I wanted to make pictures. I, I, when I was very young, I wanted to be a painter, but I, I, I didn't pursue it and also was definitely allergic to the, yeah. to the, uh, the, the paint. I mean, and you also wanted to be a priest. A priest, time. yes. I wanted to the priesthood. But when I went to New York University and I became, uh, became a film student around the second year or third year, um, I had a teacher there, Haig Minugian, yeah. Haig Minugian, who was a um, wild Armenian American guy who would, who was no nonsense about filmmaking, and uh, he drummed into us. He battered us with this. He said, "Stay with what you know. Stay with what you know." He said, "The minute I see a, one, of, one of these kids coming with a student film, picking up a gun, and starting to shoot somebody," he said, "I don't want it. I don't want it." He says, "Make a film about a guy eating an apple. Three minutes. Right. Very hard to do." Yeah. And uh, he was he was amazing because he he filled us with a lot of inspiration and forced us to dig deep in to. People have it, but then when they try to take it out, how do you express it visually? How do you express it with words and dialogue? And that's and where craft and yeah, style and, and experience yeah. yes, and, yeah. and all those other yeah. things come to bear. And he was interested. But it, it, yeah. it is the authentic, you know that story. You know your own story. Yeah. And therefore, yeah. at least it's I true know. true for writing a novel or writing. Yeah, at least, at least I, know, I know enough to explore it. Yeah. I don't know if I can make, if I can make judgments on it, on the people around me. Um, 
sometimes you wind up being harder but on that yourself. That brings me back to know? what I said about you know? Age of Innocence and where mm -hmm. we began. That was not your story, but you knew you could make it because. Oh, yes. yeah. Because of the emotion, yeah. the human emotions, and that feeling. At some time in our lives, we've had feelings like that, or we've had situations similar, let's say. And um, um, maybe times build up to, to when you reach 51 that, uh, yeah. that enough of those experiences and you could you, yeah. you, you sort of mellow to a, certain, uh, to a certain extent and you're able to express it. Have you seen uh, Taxi Driver? No, no. You don't see it? No. You can't watch it? No. Why? Um, it's very personal. I mean, and yet, you know, it's written by Paul Schrader. I it's know. really his. It's really Schrader's uh, vision. And it comes from the wonderful book, uh, Dostoevsky's right. Notes, Notes from Underground. Right. And uh, when I read that, I, I was in high school when I read it, and I was amazed by it. But I sensed it in there. I didn't, it, it's very difficult to see it, in a way. Uh, but then he also patterned it uh, on some other things, uh, Arthur Bremen's diary and mm -hmm. stuff like that, which I never read. Arthur, the guy who shot George Wallace. Uh, George Wallace. Yeah, I never read that stuff. I just reacted to the sense of uh, rage and, and uh, frustration and uh, uh, trying to, this, w this fine line between um, uh, sanity and insanity, the acting out of the fantasies. And I found that to be dangerous, uh, but something certainly worth exploring, because I know De Niro felt the same way about it, the character, and so did I, and so did Schrader. And we did it as a labor of love. Uh, Michael and Julia Phillips produced, we all felt the same way about it. Um, but it was a labor of love in the sense that it had to be done, it was, a terrible picture to make because of the uh, pressure um, from the studio at the time um, and the type of subject matter. It was, it was highly unpleasant you know, to make. We did the best we could with it. Uh, to get, we got through 40 days and 40 nights of shooting. Are you happy with it? Pretty much so. I, I, I'm happy with Mean Streets and with uh, Raging Bull, I think. Well, you've uh, got to be happy yeah. with it. But if you've seen me, you'd be happy with this too. You better close your eyes because we have a clip. Uh -oh. from Taxi Driver. Here Let's it is. <laughs> Robert De Niro. I've seen a few scenes on TV. I tell you something. Wow. Now, you were, he was talking to you. You he were was, sitting yeah, was, in front I of him, leaning uh, down. Literally, that was on, shot in a, in a, in a tenement in uh, Columbus Avenue, on 89th Street or something. And I was in front of him, kneeling in front of him, looking up. And that's why I said, you hear the drums outside, you hear the airplanes. Mm -hmm. There was so much noise, I kept saying, do it again, do it again, yeah. do it again. And he sort of got into his rhythm and began that are you talking to me business, which uh, was improvised, really. It's all Bob there really improvised it uh, right before we shot the scene. It was one of the last scenes we shot. I said, listen, I really think you need to speak to yourself in the mirror. I don't know what, what he said. I don't know what to say. Well, let's just, let's just do it. And he started playing with the gun and, and playing around like that. And you began to see what he came up with. And I and, uh, asked him a few times to repeat it a couple of times. But basically, then he got in his own role and, and went. He improvised yeah. the rest of it. And uh, you mentioned to me as he first went into that scene, Shane. Oh, yeah, little things. Uh, the, uh, the first image you saw is the gun twirling in slow motion. That's from Alan and Yeah, it's from Alan Ladd after, after he... Uh, cleans up the bad guys in, uh, in yeah. Shane, at the end of Shane, uh, the little boy is looking through the, um, uh, the, the, the saloon doors, and uh, he's below them, and he sees the guns twirl and put yeah. it right back into the holster. And it's, it's amazing to the kid. It's like magic. Um, but again, that's also in Travis's mind, in a way. He's going to clean up the bad guys, yeah. you see. And then he steps over the line of uh, sanity to insanity. Robert De Niro. Yeah. Mean Streets, Raging Bull, Taxi Driver. Good fellows, what is it between you two? <laughs> well, I always say that we never intended to uh, to make a, a, a career of the collaboration. <laughs> yeah, a lifetime of collaboration. You know, yeah, we didn't, we didn't really. I mean, in Mean Streets, I, I um, was introduced to him by Brian De Palma and Jay Cox. Mm -hmm. And De Palma had worked with him first in The Wedding Party and a film called Hi, Mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brian said, you got to meet this guy. And it turns out that we knew each other as when we were growing up in the Lower East Side. He would, uh, although he didn't come from that area, he would sort of, quote, hang out, unquote, in that area. And so we knew each other from a distance uh, when we were 15 or 16 um, and liked each other. It was very nice. It was all very Did respectful. Did he want to be an actor then? No, I didn't know. We didn't really. Yeah. He we was with another group of well. people. Right. We didn't know him that well, but it was always whenever we saw each right. other in dances or in bars and stuff, it was always very nice. And yeah. uh, I remember as being a sweet guy. And I um, uh, met him at Jay Cox's house uh, for a Christmas dinner in 1970 or so. He was talking about a film I had made called Who's That Knocking with Harvey Keitel, which is also about the neighborhood and yeah. my old friends and myself. And so when he, um, when I did Mean Streets, I wanted him to play uh, Johnny, you know, and uh, uh, he knew the people it was sort of half based on, he remembered them, mm -hmm. and he knew the style and, and, and how they lived. And so from Mean Streets, which was kind of a, a guerrilla attack of making films, 26 days shooting, right. you know, completely worked out on paper so that there was no chance of uh, losing, losing day, time, right. you know, losing a day. But I think we really start to, to, to get to work with each other carefully on Taxi Driver, in a way. We, we, we found that we responded to the same material. 
What same, kind of material? Well, uh, to a certain extent, the darker side of, um, of uh, characters, uh, the darker side. And we weren't afraid to sort of push a little further to go into more dangerous areas with the character, mm -hmm. you know? And to, uh, here's another, it's interesting, this guy, because on Taxi Driver and on Mean Streets, and Harvey too would do this, but, but Bob on, on Taxi was interesting because he would say, let me try something. And he'd do it, and it was really good. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes people say that, it's not very good. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I, I was able to trust him. Right. And I knew that I can push a little more, he can push yeah. me a little bit, and we'd go and yeah. we, we, would, we would have to do our best with each and other. And what do you think it was in you that attracted him? Uh, was it the, that he felt you protected him, or felt there was a safety in it, or you were willing to collaborate with him and give him an opportunity to? I think, I think what it was is that, number one, we were attracted to the same subject matter, right. the same type of characters. And number two, I think I was able to, um, because I respected his uh, ability so much and, and uh, how he could work with other people, I was able to create, I think, create a pretty good atmosphere for him to experiment and an atmosphere of what it's really all about, is about trusting. Is any doubt there's anybody better than he is in your mind? Nobody. Uh, that's a, well, you know, no, that's, that's I'm trying to make it easy, like, but yeah, is anybody yeah. better than he is is my I, I point, think he's not the to best. say I, he's yeah, the best, but yeah. go ahead. I, I think for me, for me, it's really, has a, 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 he has a, uh, an ability to, uh, if he understands something, yeah. meaning he understands character, plot, situation, feelings, emotion, he could go right into it and get the uh, definitive truthfulness of that moment. Yeah. And that's very rare. He has the same passion for detail you have. Yes, yeah. And uh, we have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> Raging Bull, we had yeah. a lot of fun yeah. with that. Actually, Raging Bull was the one where we really had the best collaboration. How so? How did it work? Um, Everybody, we ask, everybody always talks, as you know, they talk about the scenes and, and the authenticity yeah. of the boxing scene. They also talk about the transformation that he went through. Yeah, well, that was his idea to do Raging Bull because he wanted to uh, do a character where he would be able to change his body, actually, the way he did with Jake LaMotta. And it took me about three or four years to um, understand what I wanted to do with the picture and um, where I saw myself in the picture. And I uh, was able to make it with Bob finally in 1979. We released it in 1980. And uh, we, Paul Schrader had written the script. First, Mark Martin worked on it, my old friend who did Mean Streets with me. Then Paul. And then Paul, we, we made one more draft, but then we wanted to make more changes, and Bob and I went to uh, a resort somewhere and worked on the script. And in that process of working on the script together and rewriting it, we made the movie. Yeah. We made the movie and just felt totally comfortable with each other. And it, what he wanted to say didn't interfere with, at, at most of the time. was the same as I wanted to say, and also if it wasn't, it didn't interfere with what I, what I wanted to say. And it, it, uh, it became probably the best of our collaborations, I had the most fun, I think. Did he solicit your advice on The Bronx Tale? Uh, not necessarily, no. Well, normally, very often, I'd have him read something for me. I read his script a while yeah. back, uh, back in uh, three years ago in Bronx Tale. And then, and then um, very often, friends, you know, ask you to see their rough cut. Yeah. And uh, that's a, a difficult process because, but it's a good situation because when you look at their rough cuts or you look at pretty much of a fine cut of a picture in the work print, in the work print form, you at least have time to say, listen, be careful yeah. of that area. Yeah. Be careful here. So when, when they say, come and see my movie, it's all finished, what good is it? Exactly. If you really want my opinion, yeah. you know, it's not, either I'll enjoy it, I can watch it, I can go see it without you. you know, and it's who do you thing. call on to see your rough cuts? It's getting a fewer and fewer people. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Oh, there's, only a, there's a few friends. Um, well, the guy I used to call on all the time was Jay Cox, but yeah. on Age of Innocence, he was the, the, the co-writer. Co -writer, yeah, right. so it was very difficult. So um, there are a number of friends, about three or four people that we, uh, we grill. And have, do they change your mind about the, the work product? I mean, have they... Do they influence you to? More or less, what happens is that, what happens is that, uh, what happens is that very often these days, they're almost too much trepidation about saying anything bad about it, so you have to be very careful. So yeah. I don't question. Uh, Thelma usually questions them the next day, calls them. Oh, up. I see. And what she does is able to, able to they, they, they praise the film, praise the film, praise the film, but she said, but is there anything you found? Yeah. I said, well, there was one scene. You pull it out of them. She pulls it out, like, and, and if two or three of them talk about one area, and even if they say something totally different about that area, we know there's a problem in that area. Yeah. We know something should be looked at. If not, there's not a problem, then we should just look at that area. Yeah. And that coincided with our previews and that sort of thing. And we, it really was a great guide, but it's getting a little hard these days. Uh, not many people you can trust to, to see yeah. these things. <laughs> De one more question about De Niro. Cape Fear. Mm. He wanted to play oh, that yes. role. Oh, Max, you know, they yes. came and got you yeah. after he signed Absolutely. on. Was it Spielberg? Who was it? Steve and him together. St they ganged, came up, on and me. ganged yeah. up on you. Yeah, they really did. And, and you weren't enthusiastic about it, or you had to be convinced? Hated the idea. Why? Because um, it had already been made? or No, no, not that. Man, you know, Robert Mitchum and the original Gregory Peck, they were great. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I didn't like about it was when I was reading, when they gave me the, the, the script, what had happened was that Steve had worked on it for so long, it was yeah. his script. 
In other words, I can't do a Spielberg picture. Yeah. He could do that much better than I can, right. I, obviously. You know, I mean, he can have people running through the halls and then um, uh, that great stuff he does. Um, I mean, you look at Jurassic Park, <laughs> it's classic American action adventure filmmaking, but intellectually worked out. Right. All those shots of the dinosaur sequences, shots one, two, and three, like I talked about the boxing right. scenes, he does, he does it the same way. He, all those shots are drawn. Right. They worked out so by him. Basic and storyboarding. Basic storyboarding where it's shots one, two, and three are cut together and they produce shots four and five. And yeah. five, uh, shot five produces shot eight and nine. And it's very complex and it's, it's really a genius of what he has. And I think Jurassic is like one of the great examples of this. And so um, I, can, I approach that type of thing with two people in a ring or a dancing sequence. It's very different. I, with a dinosaur, I'm not going to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, I don't have the same empathy with it. It's a different, different kind of thing. So in the original Cape Fear script, it was more, um, more action adventure, more, more like, uh, more like uh, something that he naturally, because he had been working on the script with Wesley Strick for a long time. So I said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. And then he looked at me and said, Marty, why don't you change the script? I said, Repeat change the script. Yeah, change the script. That's a good idea. I said, okay. <laughs> I don't, you see what was happening? I was finishing up Goodfellas and I was yeah. busy. Yeah. And I kept saying, no, I don't want to, you know. And then finally I'd finished Goodfellas and we had a meeting with De Niro, myself, Wesley Strick, and a bunch of other people. They read the, the script. And uh, down at the restaurant afterwards, Steve was sitting next to me, and I said, I hate that. I said, I really, I can't do that. I said, you can do that. They're singing by the, the people. They're happy. The family's happy. I said, I can't deal with it. I said, change it. So then I realized the thing to do would he be really, to, Was it that he wanted you badly, or De Niro, or both of them? I think both of them. Yeah. I think both of them, because they saw things in it that I was not seeing, yeah. things that, things that uh, I eventually brought out of the picture uh, the religious aspects, uh, right. all that sort of thing, whatever. Um, but I really wasn't looking at it because I was so busy with the other film, quite honestly. And it was, uh, it was their yeah. project. It was a different thing. Uh, De Niro really wanted to do it because of the character. He was intrigued by the yeah. character. And yeah. he saw something interesting in the character for him. Yes. And he also saw something which actually turned out to be uh, truthful, which uh, actually the film um, it was a big um, audience picture. Right, right. And uh, something to make it, you know, yeah. and we were just, as far as I was concerned, I was very lucky. Yeah. That it, it, was it a would hit. generate a big audience. Yeah. Now, a some hit. would say that you made this film, Age of Innocence, in part because you knew that it would bring uh, the enormous attention not only of the critics, but also it would be a film that Hollywood loved because they loved Howard's mm. End and all that. Is any of that true for you? Mm, no. It was a chance to go no. to another place in no. terms of showing a group of people, look, well, I can do this too, folks. I, I think to a certain extent, I mean, there are different kinds of pictures I'd like to make. Right. I'm really trying, ultimately, I'm trying to really be like a professional. But I, I, mean, I don't mean that as a, as a joke. I mean it like a real old pro could do, yeah, exactly. go on the air, Warner Brothers walks in in the morning, Ralph Walsh picks up the script, oh, war picture, great, let's do it. You want to be yeah. that. <laughs> it would be great if I could do that. Yeah. But I can't. I'm stuck, in, I'm stuck in analyzing my own feelings, my own emotions. Um, constantly I have to find my own way through these scripts. And uh, it's, 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 um, it's not as pure, I think, as the way these real pros did it in the past. Um, and so for me, I had to find my own way. And I said I wanted to have my own way with what they would normally call a costume piece or a romance mm -hmm. film. And I was going to do it right after Goodfellas, but we slipped in Cape Fear. Yeah. You liked Goodfellas. I mean, and you can wa and obviously yeah. you liked it, yeah, but well, you can watch Goodfellas. Yes. Did you say you could watch that? Yeah, most of it. Most yeah. of it I can watch. Because it. what? I just enjoy the exhilaration of the actors and the filmmaking uh, in yeah. terms of like with Thelma and it I. It was were the having, most satisfying? Yeah. Well, not necessarily the most satisfying. It was very truthful. Yeah. I thought it was very truthful, and it was no holds barred as far as that lifestyle is concerned. Yeah. You don't like these people too bad, don't look at it. Uh, but this is what the people are. Yeah. This is what they are. I don't want to. I don't want to glamorize yeah. them. You know what I'm saying? Right. You and Pelleggi are now talking about doing something about your own neighborhood, your own yes. boy, your own childhood. Yeah. At yeah. some point, we've been working on that a few years, and we're almost there. We're almost yeah. there now. At uh, right before my father yeah. passed away, we had pretty much the final, the final thing on it. And it's uh, pretty much not my own childhood, but there. Childhood. Right. They're growing up in the Lower Your East Side. Childhood. Parents, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, the whole idea of families coming from Sicily right. and becoming Sicilian Americans, then becoming then the next generation American Sicilians, and then yeah. American. Yeah. And that whole changeover, how how people have to try, family members have to try to keep the family together in this new alien world, you know, where there's no sense of honor or uh, code. Mm. They have to they have to they have to sort of impose the code of Sicily. Um, uh, the family code, all of that to honoring the family and that's taking care of the family and uh, their characters are trying to keep everybody together, basically, you know. What do you dream now? What are your dreams? What? What do you want that you, to do to, where do you, what mountain do you want to climb? <laughs> it's a good question. I keep thinking there are so many projects that I'd like to make. Uh, I just, first of all, hope you have the time to make them. Yeah. Um, uh, 
actually, I'd like to be able to, to uh, explore different areas in filmmaking. Uh, like Age of Innocence explored a certain style, or a certain, not style, but a certain type of, type mm. of film, but opera. Um, some classics, too. Mm. Uh, I, I'm a, sort of a buff on the ancient world. I yeah. read a lot of ancient, ancient uh, uh, literature and uh, history, and I'm still fascinated by that. Um, uh, very much, very much involved also with films that have religious themes. Great to have you here. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your pleasure. Uh, Age of Innocence is the film. It's gotten uh, a lot of uh, very, very, it, a lot of people have raved about it, and it's been my honor to have you here, Marty. Pleasure.